Well, good morning, everybody. Very warm welcome to St. George's Church this morning. If you're new or visiting, my name's Nick. I'm vicar here at St. George's, and you're most welcome. If you've got little ones, it is, uh, there aren't children's groups this morning, uh, but if you've got little ones, there are some colouring at the back, and you, if they're making a bit of noise and moving around, that is absolutely fine. They are part of our, you are all part of our church family, whether you're one or a hundred, and we are welcome people as they are to be part of God's family here. I do have one sad bit of news this morning. Many of you know Mary Gorog has been poorly, uh, very poorly, and in hospital, and she passed to be with the Lord last night. Uh, but she is with the Lord in glory. She was a faithful saint, and she's been just incredible. I was blessed to go and see her on Thursday, and uh, she's kept going for a couple of days longer than people thought. Uh, but we know her faith was incredible, and her life was full of love and service. And we give thanks to God for her, and we pray for her family, and we'll be praying for her family later uh, in our prayers this morning. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet says these things through the Lord. Heal me, Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are the one I praise. We have a God who heals, who saves, who brings his people to glory in eternity. And that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let's stand and praise God. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? <coughs>
praise you that there is no condemnation now for all in Christ. Thank you that we can approach your throne boldly to pray to you, to talk with you, to hear from you. I pray this morning that each one of us will be blessed by the power of your Holy Spirit. Build your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. I'm going to read some words from the book of Acts. And it's Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 35. It will be on the screen, but if you want to follow along in the Bible, it's on page 1188. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. It's a wonderful picture of God's people gathered, supporting, caring, loving each other, giving of their own wealth to support those who have nothing. And we look on the world and we know sometimes it's just overwhelming uh, when we think of the, the needs in the world. Sometimes, though, we harden our hearts to them all, thinking we can do nothing. The resurrection teaches us that there is something more to the world than the here and now. There's a message of resurrection hope. So we're going to spend a few moments saying sorry to God. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. So we say together, we have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. We have lived in this, this world alone and doubled our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. We say, thank you. I can always say sorry to you because Jesus died for my sin. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead to bring me life. Thank you that through him, I can be your friend forever. Thank you that you love me. Amen. Well, the cross and resurrection are a wonderful promise. A promise that we are saved through faith alone. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So let's sing again. Oh God, he always keeps his promises. Because it's a promise that begun right back at the time of Abraham.
do take a seat. And Morris is going to come and read from John 21. John 21, Jesus and the Miraculous Catch of Fish can be found on page 1180. So Jesus and the Miracle Catch of Fish. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cain in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shores, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard them say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred meters. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, as we stop and dwell on this familiar story this morning, we pray your Holy Spirit would take my words and speak them to our hearts in the way that you want us to hear them. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, perceptions can have a dramatic impact on the way we respond and the way we act, the way we treat people, and the way we think. I read a story about, uh, only in America could this happen, uh, but apparently a 79-year-old woman had just finished her shopping at a local Walmart and left to drive home. She walked out towards her car, and there she saw four um, uh, youths about to drive away in it. Well, the old lady, she dropped her shopping bag, screamed at the top of her voice, pulled out a handgun from her handbag and screamed at them, I have a gun, I know how to use it, get out of my car, you horrible little men. Well, the four guys didn't wait around to find out what would happen. They legged it as fast as possible. A few moments later, she couldn't get into the car herself. And no matter how hard she tried, it wouldn't uh, start. And then she realized she'd left her car in a different parking space. <laughs> so putting her bags down, she now got into her own car, drove down to the police station to confess what she'd done. And she told the story to the duty sergeant. Uh, he started laughing and pointed to the four young men at the end of the desk, saying how they were describing a little old lady with glasses pulling a gun on them. Only in America. It might be apocryphal, I don't know. But perceptions really do impact the way we think about people, don't they? You see four youths and what you think is your car, you think well, they're automatically they're robbing it. You see someone with a gun, you think they're going to rob you. Well, 
I wonder what perceptions we have of Jesus. I wonder what perceptions the disciples had of Jesus at this point. This is the third time that Jesus has appeared to his disciples. The first two times being in a locked room. So the disciples knew that Jesus had risen, and yet they still didn't fully understand what was going on. They were unsure about what were the next steps. I wonder what you would do in that situation. Well, the disciples, it seems, decide to return to normal life. They knew Jesus had risen, but at the end of the day, they were a small bunch of a dozen or so people uh, afraid of the authorities. This wasn't uh, a group ready to proclaim the gospel and start the largest faith movement in the history of the world. They were just a few people who were weak and afraid. So Peter decides he's going back to his old career. And six of the other disciples, they go with him. They go fishing. They don't know what's going to happen next. Maybe it was sheer boredom. Maybe it was out of necessity to earn some money to eat. We don't know. But they head off to go fishing. And sometimes in the Christian life, I think it can be a bit like that. We can wonder what is going to happen next. And we get maybe a little bit bored, a little bit frustrated, a little bit fed up that things aren't going our way, wondering where Jesus is in everything. And we just go back to our normal way of life. And that's not necessarily the wrong thing, depending on how we do go about it. Sometimes it's just a period of waiting we have to work with. But it can feel sometimes that we've come to a dead end and a bit directionless. I remember um, my own life when I finished university. I know that's a long time ago now. Um, nearly 29 years. And I didn't know what to do next. I was looking for a job. I'd sent out over 100 applications and had 100 rejections or a number of interviews and been rejected. Uh, and it was getting pretty desperate trying to find out, what does God want me to do with my life? I was Christian, but I was a young Christian. I made some big mistakes. And uh, in hindsight, God was simply preparing me for a new venture, humbling me, perhaps, forcing me to wait and trust. And sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to wait and trust. Just waiting with hopeful expectations that God will take you where he wants you. So the disciples, they go back to what they know. They go back to fishing. Uh, apparently, the Sea of Galilee in ancient uh, times was a sight to behold. It, apparently, the best time to go fishing on the Sea of Galilee is at night. And so these seven men would head out onto the waters, probably expecting to catch enough fish for a few meals. And with them, there'd be dozens of other little boats sailing around, working hard at night. But for these guys, the night is over and they haven't caught a sprat. Nighttime on the Lake of Galilee can be quite cold. Most likely, Peter's got a warm smock, but he's taken it off because the work's been so hard, uh, and uh, he's overheating. So they head back to shore, and they see this guy on the shore, and he says, have you caught any fish? I don't know how you would feel if you've been out working all night trying to fish, and some guy on the shore says, have you got any? Be a little bit kind of, well. But worse, he says, throw your net out on the right side. Now, it's only true from the shore. Sometimes you can see better than you can from the boat. But either way, this is a truly miraculous catch. The net goes in. And the seven men can't haul them back in for the number of fish caught. In verse 7, we're told that the disciple who the Lord loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. Imagine 
just for a moment, the change of feeling these men would experience when they realize the perception of this guy on the, on the bank isn't just some guy uh, saying, pointing out that they've failed. Not even some guy is pointing out they've failed and giving them a helping hand, but he is the Messiah. He is Jesus. The risen Jesus is there. And there beside him is a fire burning, uh, and there's fish, and there's bread. Harking back to the feeding of the 5,000, in fact. The disciples would have seen this and just remembered, this is Jesus, the one who fed the hungry in the wilderness, the one who is the, the promised new prophet from the Old Testament, one like Moses. And Jesus is, again, trying to change their perceptions to let them know that all they need is him. They just need to trust him. He's got a plan. Without a word from Jesus, they hadn't caught a single fish. But with his help, they'd caught an abundance. In fact, we're told how many. 153 large fish. Now, there have been loads of weird and wonderful attempts by theologians to try and explain the number 153, uh, different meanings of the numbers, and there are meanings to numbers in scriptures, but they're also weird and wonderful. Even John Calvin termed the efforts as childish trifling. If there was a meaning, it is long lost. My guess, Occam's razor and all that, it is later on, it was such a big catch of fish, they thought, I wonder how many we've got. And someone simply counted them. And we got 153. Can you believe that? What was amazing, though, was the net wasn't torn. This really was divine intimation. This really was God in the lives of the disciples. Jesus really had risen. They knew it, but now they knew it all the more. Not just that he had appeared to them in the room... He was a physical resurrection. Here he was cooking them food, cooking them breakfast, and then eating. Without them, they could do nothing. With him, they were fed. The disciples were fed, but not just physically. There's a spiritual feeding going on here. And that's true for us as well. We need to come back to Jesus for spiritual feeding. The disciples are about to be sent off on their greatest mission to the ends of the earth to spread the good news. They just had a little longer to wait for Pentecost for the Holy Spirit. And I don't know where you are in your life right now, in your, your Christian life. You may be committed Christian, but a little bit of a rut. You may be going for Jesus full heart, heart, wholeheartedly. You might be questioning, is Jesus real? Is the resurrection real? Well, this is another piece of evidence that it really was that these weak, feeble men rapidly became the greatest movement on earth for good. Sometimes our waiting seems unbearable. The disciples, I'm sure, were finding it intolerable, wondering when things were going to happen. But if that's you, be patient. Keep going with Jesus. Keep feeding on him. Keep studying his word, keep playing part of a church family. Keep serving where you can. Speak with him, spend time with him. Dwell on his words. Jesus fed his disciples so that they would go on to disciple others, to build the church, spread the good news of the love of God. Are we prepared to do the same? It's not always easy. All of those disciples, by one, died pretty brutal deaths, died young. And even if you are busy doing lots for, for, of ministry, whether it's in the church or outside the church, and I know different people have different gifts and different places they serve, it can be so easy sometimes just to be so busy doing that you don't stop and spend time with Jesus. Always trying to keep a good book on the go, a good Christian book. It's where we source in uh, wisdom and knowledge 
other Christians and ultimately the scriptures themselves. As the disciples came to Jesus on this shore, uh, none of them asked, who are you? They knew it was the Lord, we're told. And we're told this is now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. They were dying, weren't they? They were dying to ask, is it really you? They still weren't completely convinced. But for us, we should drop our doubts, drop our fears, trust that Jesus is alive and can take us forward so we can feed on him and he feeds us so we can feed others. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us when we have wrong perceptions of Jesus, when we think he's distant from us, or when we think uh, he isn't taking us where we want, isn't giving us what we think we need. Help us to uh, change those perceptions to know that he is the risen Lord, the risen King. And whatever's going on in our lives, Lord, that we can trust him, for he is the resurrection. Help us, Lord, to trust him. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing, I stand amazed in the presence. Please stand.
take a seat as we turn to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, because of the death and resurrection of your son Jesus Christ, you commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. You have brought us into the light to light our hearts and minds so that we might be brought closer to you and each other. We pray that we can work in your light. God, your son reminded, sorry, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As we rejoice in the gift of a new day, we ask Lord Jesus for your wisdom, for your strength and your power to be constantly present within us. We pray that you make us strong and courageous and bind us together through you to empower our fellowship and fill us with Jesus' love. Let the resurrection of your son transform our lives. Make us bold in serving you and bringing good news to other people. Christ Jesus, we believe that you are with us as we pray. You are our own living saviour that always hears us when we call upon you and you respond with an open and loving heart. Open our hearts to your power, moving around us and between us and within us until your glory is revealed in our love for both friend and enemy, on communities transformed by justice and compassion and in the healing of all that is broken. We pray for the leadership of our country and commitment of our government and leaders of the people, for them not to lead selfishly off of personal ambition or vain conceit, but to open their hearts to the service of the poor and promote justice and equality. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all people of the world, especially those who long for peace, freedom from oppression and for justice. Lord, hear the cries of all who are in trouble and who are distressed. We think about all wars that are happening at the moment and pray there would be peace amongst nations. We pray for lives lost, homes destroyed, and cities razed to the ground. Pray for all who are starving and those who are lacking medical supplies. We ask that the convoys carrying humanitarian aid can safely reach those who are in need. We also pray for the earth, for climate change that is impacting on all of us, for those who are affected by natural disasters and by global warming. Draw near and comfort those who are in conflict and that the good news of resurrection, new life and salvation will reach even into the darkest places of suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, you have called us to follow in the ways of your risen son and to take care of those who are companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love, seeking to be true friends to all. We offer our prayers on behalf of the church and the world. We pray for disciples of Jesus, especially those whose faith is being tested beyond endurance and those who have to meet behind locked doors for fear of persecution, torture or death. We ask for your blessing on our church and church leaders and their families. We thank you for all who volunteer within our church. Think of their precious time working for your glory. Living God, let the resurrection of your son transform lives. Make us bold in serving you and bringing your good news to other people. We pray for ourselves, our families and friends, that we may see the risen Christ in them and they might see him in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear God, we place our worries in your hands. We place our sick under your care and humbly ask that you restore them to health again. Grant us the grace to acknowledge your will and know that whatever you do, you do for the love of us. We pray for King Charles, Catherine, Princess of Wales, for our church family, for Pat, Sheila, Anya, Susan, Maureen Sweeting, Roy and Marilyn Lofthouse, Sylvia, Jean, Margaret, and Jenny. We pray for those who are wounded, distressed, lonely, or afraid, 
especially those whose earthly lives are drawing to a close, that they may know the healing presence and peace of Christ alongside them. We pray for the grieving families of Sonia Kelly, Janice Layden, Linda Fergus, Dennis Walner, and of course our dear sister Mary Gorog. Let them know that in their grief and pain, you, Lord, are their comfort and strength. Surround them with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we offer these prayers to you, trusting that you hear us and answer us in love and compassion. We pray that your will may be done in our lives and in the lives of those who we pray, for who we pray, and that you will show us what we need to do to bring the kingdom, your kingdom, into our world. May the new life of Easter be our guiding light. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, as we come to communion, let's stand and sing again, Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day.
Let us pray. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Almighty and Eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise and opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his suffering of himself, made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make memorial to Christ, your Son, our Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. Accept through him, our great High Priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. All honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So as our Saviour has taught us, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We welcome all who know and trust the Lord Jesus to come and share with bread and wine. Let's pray at the prayer of humble access as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, though in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed to his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Draw near with faith.
We're told in John's Gospel that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded in Scripture. But these, we're told, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I just felt when we were sharing bread and wine, there's somebody here this morning who's struggling to believe, struggling to believe that they have life in Jesus' name. And maybe this morning is a time to come on your knees to the Lord and say, forgive my unbelief. Help me to believe. These signs were written for you. Lord God, our Father, through our Saviour Jesus Christ, you've assured your children of eternal life. And in baptism, you've made us one with him. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your love, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to stand and sing this wonderful Easter hymn, Thine be the glory. So Christ, give us the grace to grow in holiness, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him, the risen Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst us and all whom we love, now and forever. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.